Hi, Rob Baker here. At the moment, I'm doing a reworking of my study of Eyes Wide Shut. Uh, I'm expanding my previous analysis of the film, uh, and I'm splitting it up into several videos over the next uh, month or so. And in examining the film again, I've come across some fascinating information about newspaper reports, both in the film and about Stanley Kubrick's death. So I'm going to go through the ones in the film first, and I won't always be able to show you the parts of the film that I'm talking about, uh, because this is a YouTube video and I can't show nudity from the film on that basis. Alright, so first we're going to go over the news articles within the movie, and then we'll get to the real world articles after Stanley Kubrick's death. Okay, so in Eyes Wide Shut there's a murder mystery of sorts. In the opening party scene, lead character Bill Harford is summoned to a bathroom to try and revive a woman called Mandy who had apparently overdosed on speedball. She survives. Later in the movie, Bill Harford gate crashes a masked orgy at a huge mansion, and a mysterious woman in a mask tries to warn him to leave. But Bill is literally unmasked, and just as it appears he's about to be gang-raped, perhaps, they ask him to get him naked, the mysterious woman offers herself as a sort of replacement sacrifice in order that Bill be allowed to go free. Later on in the movie, Bill reads a newspaper article saying that an ex-beauty queen has overdosed in a hotel and has been rushed to hospital. He goes to the hospital and learns that she has since died. He sees the dead body in the morgue, and it's then explained in dialogue that the dead woman is in fact Mandy, who'd overdosed at the beginning of the movie, and that it was her who sacrificed herself to save Bill at the orgy. The language is a little bit vague in places, but that seems to be what Ziegler is saying. So we're left wondering, did Mandy really just die of an overdose or was she killed in some sort of sacrifice? The full article about her overdose is shown on screen a couple of times, at which points we can pause and read the details. It outlines that Mandy had been brought back to her hotel at 4am by two unidentified men and that the next morning she was discovered in an overdose state and rushed to hospital. It says the police want to speak to the two men who brought her home and that they don't know if anyone was with Mandy when she OD'd. Yet the article also says there's nothing suspicious, so a slight contradiction. Then there's some family statements about Mandy's aspirations to be an actress after winning a Miss New York beauty contest. The article finishes with an important final statement that Mandy had lots of powerful friends in the fashion and entertainment industries and that rumours have been circulating of an affair between Mandy and a fashion guru called Leon Vitali. Now I think this is crucial to unravelling the plot. Leon Vitali was actually Kubrick's personal assistant on Eyes Wide Shut and many other films, and he's credited as playing the character Red Cloak, who appeared to be in charge of the OG Secret Society, and who issued a direct warning to Bill not to speak publicly about what he'd seen. And get this, when Bill is followed in the street by a bald guy in a Mac, there's a Vitali sign in the background. These streets were constructed sets, and so the details are full of little jokes, easter eggs, and hints of what's happening in the plot and in the mind of Bill Harford. For example, remember the scary room 237 in The Shining? Well, as Bill has followed, he passes a restaurant that's numbered 237. There's lots of stuff like that going on in these uh, fake street sets. So the casting of Leon Vitali as Red Cloak and his name being featured in the newspaper article about Mandy, indicates that Mandy was having some sort of affair with Red Cloak himself. But we also knew from early in the film that she had something going on with Victor Ziegler. Check out my video Red Cloak Unmasked for some further evidence that Red Cloak and Ziegler are symbolically the same person, even though they're played by different actors. You see, the orgy is at least partially a dream sequence. That's why Mandy is played by a different actress during the orgy, the characters are psychological archetypes relating to people Bill has met in his waking state experiences. Okay, so obviously the newspaper prop is important to the film's plot, but it goes beyond this. When Bill picks up the paper, it has the words lucky to be alive in huge bold letters, and unusual for a front page story, no accompanying pictures. The secondary title says that it's a story about a dog who saved a family from a fire, but the large text is prominent enough to be either consciously noticed by the audience or at least to play on them subconsciously. Now this lucky-to-be-alive text is nothing new. Many online reviewers have pointed it out before, and I talked about it years ago. However, in re-examining the movie recently, I started to notice that there's more interesting newspaper headline text, but much harder to notice without freeze-framing from time to time. For example, when Bill opens the newspaper and flips through some pages, 
Other titles are written bold enough to be partially readable. One reads, Star Dies. Tom Cruise was a star, and as is evident in the article about Mandy, there are references to people involved in the movie production. Another partially viewable headline reads, The Party. Yeah, Bill has attended two parties, one at Ziegler's and one at Somerton Mansion. And here's a funny one. When Bill first walks into the cafe for safety, the paper folded under his arm reads, Cool. As a film star, Tom Cruise is considered cool. And when he sits down, we see a little bit more of the title. It says, Cool as, but I couldn't read the last word. The common phrase, Cool as ice, is probably what it says. In the shots where Bill looks at the article about Mandy, the accompanying partially readable articles are interesting too. The ones on the left and above are about a real hostage situation which occurred in 1996 when Eyes Wide Shut was going into production. The boxed text is about a loosely related railroad massacre in 1993 and it outlines a woman politician named McCarthy attending her dead husband's memorial after he was killed in the 1993 massacre. And there's a photo from the hostage incident with some text underneath. I don't know if this entire text has been lifted verbatim from a real article about those two cases, but here's a couple of real articles from the New York Daily and New York Times which give basically the same information. In other words, the newspaper version seen in Eyes Wide Shut isn't fiction, it's based on real events. On the right side of the page we have another real case of Amy Grossberg and Brian Peterson who killed their own baby and were sent to prison for it. A prosecutor named Capone is mentioned in the article which I thought funny considering the infamous gangster Al Capone and Bill's fear of having messed with the wrong people. So it basically seems that real news stories were used as filler in this newspaper prop. They may have been verbatim copies or reworded versions to fill the space around the article about Mandy. The latter would make sense in terms of spatial arrangements, or it could even be that the whole page layout was from a real edition of the New York Post and that the article about Mandy was placed conveniently in to replace a previous story. Both of these real-world stories involve murder, the thing which Bill is fearing for himself and his family. And there's a sentence up here which seems highly relevant to the general philosophy of Kubrick's movies. It reads, quote, just how fragile we are and how much violence is with us, end quote. The Clockwork Orange, Dr. Strangelove, The Shining, Barry Lyndon, Full Metal Jacket, don't Kubrick's films all convey some elements of facing our own personal demons? The use of real news articles as props within Kubrick fiction films was present in The Shining too, and with even more relevance to the themes of the movie. See my video Kubrick's Gold Story for more about that. And in A Clockwork Orange there's some interesting use of fiction newspaper props in which the real-life author of the A Clockwork Orange novel gets mentioned in the news clips within the movie. So, lots going on with these newspaper articles in Eyes Wide Shut. And it doesn't stop there. In fact, it gets more weird. But first, a little bit more about the possibility of murder versus accidental overdose regarding Mandy. First of all, the article says Mandy OD'd in the Florence Hotel, but there is no actual Florence Hotel in New York, at least I haven't been able to find one. That seems to have been made up for the film. Second, it seems weird that a mere overdose that doesn't yet involve a death would get its own in-depth news article in a big city like New York, where there's all kinds going on every day, and probably lots of overdoses and murders. I suppose we can let that go, because the article prop helps take the film's plot forward. Bill later learns that Mandy died in the hospital at 3.45pm, which doesn't exactly point to murder, does it? If you're a professional working for a rich client and you're going to kill someone, you do the job properly. You don't leave them to be potentially revived in hospital so that they can then report to the police what happened. The timing of Mandy dying the next day after ODing fits with Ziegler saying that she had been speedballing at his party. What did she take? A uh, speedball or a snowball or whatever the hell they call it. You know, it's, 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 it's heroin and coke. Combining the upper and downer effects of heroin and cocaine causes the user to have a delayed awareness that they've overdosed whereas either drug causing an overdose on its own is quicker to cause death. So that fits quite well with Mandy overdosing and then not dying until 3.45pm in the hospital. Now here's another thing. Nick Nightingale was reported to have been taken to his hotel by two men at 4.30am, that's what the clerk says, and that he then left with them at 5am. 
So if the same two men took Mandy home at 4am, as is said in the newspaper, then they obviously left her hotel right away in order to take Nick home. And if the intention was to kill Nick, then why let him be seen by a hotel clerk, sporting a black eye, getting stuff from his room, and then being taken away in a car at 5am? That would be extremely unprofessional for a murder. So I don't think any of this stuff points to murder at all. In fact, the -the over-the-top suggestions of murder are too obvious for a Kubrick film. He preferred generally to make more cryptic movies, not to spell things out with dialogue explanations and road sign evidence that may as well be flashing in giant neon letters. So I think Ziegler's verbal account at the end of the movie is mostly true, except it's possible that he had met Mandy at the hotel after the Summerton orgy, that she'd overdosed with him for a second time like she'd done in his bathroom, and that either he snuck out of the hotel and left her to die, or the police came and he persuaded them to keep quiet about his own involvement and may have offered a bribe to do so. Remember, he persuaded Bill to keep his mouth shut too. I'm glad I was here. And Bill, I probably... Oh, I know I don't have to mention this, but this is just between us. Okay. Of course. His conversation with Bill at the end of the film supports the notion that he was at the hotel when the police came. He says that Bill had told Mandy it was just a matter of time, but Bill didn't say that. The newspaper article says it. Come on. It was always going to be just a matter of time with her. Remember? You told her so yourself. You remember the the one with the great tits who OD'd in my bathroom? But much more suspicious is this statement from Ziegler. There was nothing suspicious. Her door was locked from the inside. The police are happy. End of the story. But the newspaper article doesn't say that the door was locked from the inside. How could Ziegler know a thing like that if he hadn't at least privately spoke to the police about Mandy's overdose? And how could the door to Mandy's room be locked from the inside after the staff had gone in and checked on her? That's why an ambulance was called in the first place. Ziegler's story doesn't add up. Remember that the article says it's unclear if someone was with Mandy when she OD'd. So I think Ziegler was there. Nothing happened to her after you left that party that hadn't happened to her before. She got her brains fucked out. Period. Notice how nervous he gets as Bill presses for answers. What kind of fucking charade ends with somebody turning up dead? (sighs) Okay, Bill, let's, 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 let's cut the bullshit, all right? And he sort of stutters and repeats himself as he claims that she was taken home by someone else. When they took her home, she was, she was just fine. Maybe he even bribed this clerk at the hotel to say that two mysterious men had brought Mandy home, and so not to identify Ziegler himself. We're never told what exactly Ziegler does for a living, but the article says Mandy's agent called the hotel to ask the staff to check on her the next morning. Maybe Ziegler himself was her agent. He did have models in attendance at his party. I was doing a photo session in Rockefeller Plaza on a very windy day. Okay, so back to the newspaper details. Two reporters' names are listed. One is Marilyn Rohrbe and the other is Larry Salona. These are both real-life reporters who've worked for the New York Post, the same newspaper that Bill has a fake copy of in the film. Marilyn Rober, also known as Maz Rober, is seen here, interviewed about a book release. She's the one with the black hair. And Larry Salona? Well, here's where things get very interesting. Larry was hired by Kubrick to assist with the creation of convincing newspaper props for Eyes Wide Shut, and he's credited as journalistic advisor on the film. It was Larry Salona himself who reported on Kubrick's death for the New York Post just before Eyes Wide Shut was released. His first report, written the day after Stanley's death, offers an outline of his involvement with the film's production. He says he'd spoken with Stanley Kubrick a couple of times about how the report of Mandy's death should be written within the film. And he says that Kubrick initially had a copy of the Mandy article sent to him that had already been written for the movie, and he asked for a professional journalist rewrite. Larry then says he conversed with Kubrick's assistant, Anthony Fruin, over a hundred times on the subject. Presumably this involved multiple rewrites, which makes the use of double-line errors in the finished article in the movie even more odd. 
And Laddie states that a colleague of his, Billy Fay, or Faze, or Fies, I don't know how to pronounce his name, created the Lucky to be Alive cover of the paper that Bill reads in the film. So I think it's safe to assume that the additional headlines we glimpse on that same paper in the movie were written by Larry Salona or his colleagues at the New York Post. You know, the ones that say, Star Dies and The Party. The second of Larry's articles about Kubrick's death came the next day on March 9th, 1999. That's two days after Kubrick's death. And it carries bizarre parallels with the report of Mandy's death in the film. Larry's article is titled, Kubrick, happy, joking, just before death. What a weird title. In the article about Mandy, it says she was giggling when last seen alive. Larry cites a Hollywood source close to Kubrick about him laughing and joking, but he doesn't say who it was. Larry's article includes a statement that there was nothing suspicious about Kubrick's death. The article in the film about Mandy, written by the same reporter, Larry Salona, says the same thing about her, that there was nothing suspicious. In fact, just over half of the initial news reports I've read about Kubrick's death say the same thing. That Hertfordshire police authorities had announced Kubrick's death on behalf of the family and had stated there is nothing suspicious about his death. It seems odd that the police would announce that there was no suspicion when Kubrick being found at home sounds like a standard natural death, especially considering his age. Even the initial reports of Michael Jackson's death, who died at age 50, made no mention of there being nothing suspicious. And given how famous he was and the blatant enemies he'd made, one would expect murder theories about Michael Jackson to be more likely. So it seems to me that these multiple news reports of there being nothing suspicious about Kubrick's death have simply fanned the flames of murder theory rather than dispelling them. And that's without it even being common knowledge that this report of Kubrick's death and this report of Mandy's death are cited as being written by the same journalist Larry Salona. Add to that the parallel of Mandy last seen giggling and Kubrick last seen laughing and joking. What the hell is going on here with these parallels? Two deaths, one on screen, one off screen, both of which have generated theories of murder relating to the same movie. Is this some sort of cosmic joke by Stanley Kubrick or by someone else involved in the production? Personally, I don't believe for one minute that Kubrick was killed for making Guys Wide Shut. That would be the worst form of damage limitation because it would and has prompted many viewers to embrace theories about Freemasons, the Illuminati, the Hellfire Club and so on being featured in the film. There are now tons of articles and videos out there alleging that the secret society seen in Eyes Wide Shut is an accurate depiction of the world's most powerful people and that they killed Kubrick. Now, if Kubrick were exposing some real secret society, then the effective response from that group would be to either stop the film being released at all, or failing that, let it be released, but prompt or bribe a bunch of shill critics in the media to declare that Stanley Kubrick had gone insane and turned into a full-fledged conspiracy theorist, or worse, a traitor with ties to some foreign power. That was pretty much the approach taken when Kubrick's political bombshell Dr. Strangelove was released, a movie that seriously damaged the reputations of those in positions of military and intelligence agency power. Kubrick was accused of being pro-communist. The smear attack approach was also taken against Paul Verhoeven's military fascism satire film Starship Troopers. Verhoeven wasn't killed, but the movie was branded as pro-fascist by critics, even though it was obviously actually anti-fascist. Same thing happened with Kubrick's A Clockwork Orange, which showed government mind control programs and is now latched onto as supposed evidence by people who have taken the declassified MK Ultra documents off into fantasy land. And how about when Robert De Niro directed the movie Good Shepherd, a movie showing scenes of the Skull and Bones secret society being the apparent basis of the CIA? Nobody killed Robert De Niro for making that. So I don't buy the murder theory about Kubrick at all. But I do think there's something very odd going on with those newspaper articles in and out of Eyes Wide Shut regarding the deaths of Mandy and Kubrick himself. I don't have any explanation for it other than it being a possible long-shot coincidence but nor am I jumping to conclusions without sufficient information. The plot thickens, folks. The plot thickens. You've been listening to Rob Ager. I'm currently working on more material related to Eyes Wide Shut, so make sure to subscribe if you're new to my work. You can support me on Patreon if you want more of my future videos to be available on YouTube. 
And you can read lots of film study articles on my website, collativelearning.com, where you'll also find a ton of digital downloads on film analysis and other subjects. Bye for now, folks.